Carlson, with his co-driver, receives the trophy as outright winner of the 1962 Monte Carlo Rally. But this is the beginning of the story, a story that starts many months before in nearly every country in Europe. A well-prepared car is three quarters of the answer to winning the rally, and from the works of the biggest manufacturers to the private entrance garage beside his house, there's the same excitement, enthusiasm and insistence that everything must be in perfect order to compete in what, for 30 years, has been regarded as the world's most glamorous rally. All too quickly, it's scrutineering day, and tomorrow is the start of the two and a half thousand mile journey to the sun of the Mediterranean. But in Glasgow, it's raining, as the competitors report. Sidney Allard, 1952 winner and one of the most experienced Monte veterans, fixes his numbers. But this year, Alan, his son, competing in his first Monte, did more than follow in Dad's footsteps. He finished ahead of him. Here's his anger up on the ramp. And this was the scene at all the other starting points. Car number 94, the Triumph driven by Alex Cleghorn and Rodney Wright, has its seat belts fitted. These are pretty well standard equipment for rally cars nowadays, and this year they prove their worth again. A little servicing for Ron Johnson's Morris, while the ceiling goes on by the RAC scrutineers. Sally Ann Cooper and Rosemary Smith, and another ladies' team, Anne Hall and Valerie Domleo, last year's Coupe des Dames winners. Here's one of the ITV team, the Anglia driven by Gordon Wilkins and Michael Frostick. Another ITV team car, the Sunbeam, crewed by Bill Ward, Ray Joss and Vic Elford. Every mechanical aid known to man on this one, including the camera that took some of this film. So it went on all day. Then most of the crews went to bed early for tomorrow's 4 a.m. start. But we've forgotten to scrutineer the crews, so everyone's vaccinated because of the great smallpox scare. Suddenly it's 4 a.m. and any minute they'll be off. The sky is throwing down little handfuls of rain and sleet, and it seems a long, long way to the sunny south of France. It is, so let's get started. Three, two, one, good luck and they're off. Next man off, some of the heavy metal, Lyndon Sims, Aston Martin. Then Ken Piper's DKW that was to have a misunderstanding with another motor car in France. Bill Ward slips number 52 into gear and off they go. Through the crowd in Blythewood Square, the first of the ITV team to get underway. Let's go with them for a moment for the first part of the journey through the dark Glasgow streets. By ten past five, fifty-six of the Glasgow starters had left, and here's the fifty-seventh. Anne Hall and Valerie Domleo being terribly courteous at the lights. After you. No, ladies first. Please, I insist. Oh, all right then. Phil Walton's big Jaguar. He won the hill climb at Monte in this last year. On they all go through the night, leaving Glasgow and circling round through Melrose before crossing the border and driving down into England. Now we're well down the country, passing Concert Iron and Steelworks in County Durham, and it'll soon be time for breakfast. And here's our first break coming up, Scotch Corner. Everyone arrived here quite happily, except for Dr. Alex Mitchell. He'd lost a lot of sleep the night before, giving smallpox vaccinations, and most unluckily overturned his Riley. Phil Walton brings his Jaguar to a stop. No, he doesn't. Ray Joss does it for him. 
Outside the hotel, there's plenty for the crowd to look at on the rally cars. And inside, there's plenty to talk over at breakfast. The weather so far? Well, Bill Ward's happy about it. Ray Merrick's finished his breakfast and he's getting on with refueling the car. The first time there's been an E-type on the Monte and the only one entered. change of driver and off goes 52 on the next stretch of the journey and the next stop will be Banbury. Meanwhile on the continent the other starters are getting underway and this is the scene at the Oslo start. Lawrence Handley's Ford leaves the start. It's a lot colder here than it was in Glasgow. And here's Mr. Raleigh himself, Eric Carlson, who was outright winner with his co-driver Hagbom. And the very next car? Miss Raleigh. Pat Moss, who won the Coupe des Dames with co-driver Anne Wisdom. And it's not long before car 316, Alan Fraser and Leslie Shirley Price's Sunbeam, is following the eventual winners out of Oslo and onto the long trek down into France through the murky Scandinavian dawn. The scene was much the same in Frankfurt, as Hermann Batscherer rolled away in his Mercedes. The Blackpool starters. Oh, sorry. The Place Vendôme at nine o'clock in the morning. And off goes Guy Verrier's Citroen. Of course, it's Paris, silly of me. And tearing himself away is John Carter at the wheel of the third ITV team car, co-driven by Alan Collinson. And here are the boys who start at the finish, Monte Carlo. The first man away is Swiss entry, Gerard Spinetti. By now, the Athens, Warsaw and Lisbon starters are on the road as well. Back at Banbury, the Glasgow starters are arriving at their first time control after the easy journey from Scotch Corner. And in France again, the Paris starters are motoring along the long tree-lined roads of northern France to their first time control at Vervain. Gregor Grant pulls in with the Sunbeam Alpine, co-driven by Cliff Davies. Lucien Bianchi, the Belgian entrant. Robert Nieri. And John Cotter. Où est la what? Oh, the control. Over there. No, that way. That's it. And away go Paddy Hopkirk and Jack Scott, who did so well to finish third. On they go through France over the border into Belgium to the next time control at Liège, where Douglas Rossdale and Peter Freeman are just setting off on the next leg to The Hague. At the East Grinstead passage control, Lyndon Sims Aston reports in. This is the last control before Dover, and there turned out to be some pretty foggy weather to drive through on the last few miles into Dover. This is the last chance of a little servicing and checking up before getting on the boat, and lots of the competitors are using it. They're all rolling in now, Bob Crawford's Morris, Morris Davies, followed by Wilkins and Frostick. Down the ramp onto the Lord Warden they go for a pretty rough crossing. But a lot of the crews managed to take advantage of the break to snatch a little rest. Or a little drink, or whatever else you can think of. The crossing did nothing to improve the weather, and the cars began to roll off the boat in torrential rain. Doc 
documents were checked at the Boulogne control, and off went Anne Hall. Several competitors were complaining of some irritation and discomfort from the smallpox jabs by now. The Paris starters come through the Boulogne control too, and Alan Collinson and John Carter leave and the ITV entered Riley after checking in. Maurice Trantignor says, Quelle heure est-il? It's chocolate heure. I've heard of iron rations, but this is ridiculous. Off we go on the first of the continental legs of the rally, through Montreuil and Rouen, and on to the control at Lisieux. So far, conditions have been unusually good, and the old-timers are already calling it the easiest rally ever. But nobody's underestimating what can happen on the special sections of the last part of the route, when we are going to find the traditional Monte conditions of snow and ice. But for the moment, we watch the clock and we watch the map, and make sure we reach every control on time. Ray Joss checks in for car 52. The Davies Buxter Lotus gets away. Michael Frostick and Gordon Wilkins again. And Dobson and Lightfoot in a Mini Cooper. The first time these little cars have appeared in the Monty. No number? That'll cost him a few penalty points. May we? Oui. Tom Patton and Charles Kerr riding herd. And Alex Cleghorn and Rodney Wright going very nicely, thank you. Charles Glenny and Brian Whitmarsh stop to refuel the new Vauxhall VX40 competing in its first rally that they've driven from Glasgow. Like nearly everyone else, they've had an easy ride so far with a completely clean slate. In fact, the rally is already starting to be known as the Joyride. The ITV camera car takes on some petrol and soon they'll be back on the road filming the rally as the cars head for the next control at Rennes. Four hours after leaving the control at Lisieux, we arrive at Rennes. There's Michael Frostick again, and the Morrisons, a couple of Scots who started from Glasgow, drinking tea. Quite a number of cars ran on tungsten-studded tyres the whole way this year, and there was a lot of discussion at the end about the effect this had on timing. It certainly slowed down some people who were expecting to find certain sections covered in ice, but in fact found conditions quite good. John Spare and Michael Britton drive away from the control while Vic Elford quietly collects someone's telephone number. Our next control is at Angers, a little under two hours away, and then if we read the clock, the map and the speedometer correctly, we'll have rather more than another four hours to travel before we arrive at the beautiful cathedral city of Bourges, the next time control on the route. I wonder how many crews said we must come back and have a proper look at this one day. The first of the Glasgow starters arrives. The Lisbon cars have already been through. In they all come and there's no time for sightseeing. But there is time for the drivers to have a quick snack and a chat about how they're doing. Let's have a good look at the car. Because before long, we'll be getting into the rough stuff. The Paris starters come through Bourges as well and soon they're off on the three-hour night driving section to Avalon. Avalon Control, we've been on the road two days and a night, and this is around halfway. Most people haven't lost any marks, but Ken Piper was shunted up the exhaust pipe by Spanish Entry 29 just before Avalon. There was no ice on the high section before the town, and nearly everyone arrived with time in hand. Next up, Reims. So on we go through the night. In comes Peter Fitzgerald and looks for the sign telling the Glasgow starters where to park. At Reims, the Auto Club de Champagne had provided a splendid champagne and chicken buffet for all the drivers, which was very much appreciated. And it was here that the Warsaw and Oslo starters joined up with us. More free gifts here, bottles of orange juice, Coca-Cola and so on. I wonder, is there any truth in the theory that this is a devilish, cunning French ploy to add at least a hundred weight to each car by the time it reaches saint Cloud with empty bottles, souvenirs and tourist leaflets? Next stop for us, Chaumont, the last control before the Col de Schlitt. <laughs> 
Most people had planned to change to studded tyres here for the section over the Col de Schlucht. The manufacturers were all ready to help. But the reports were the conditions were very good and nearly all the cars went ahead with standard boots on. At Boulogne, we'd been told that the regulations had been altered to include a couple of sections with a limit of 50 kilometres per hour, and one of these was from Belfort to the top of the Col. This led to some surprisingly low speed rally driving from some competitors and some hawk-eyed vigilance from other navigators while their drivers belted on regardless. Another of these limited sections occurred between Saint-Claude and Chambéry. Before long, we were at the passage control at Belfort. Then we began to run up the Rhine Valley through Mulhaus, the next passage control at Colmar, and so into Munster and up the Col. Plenty of snow up there by the look of it. I knew these minis were fantastic little cars, but I think Morris dancing is going a bit far, don't you? Someone else has gone a bit far. Now we're over the top of the Col de Schlucht, and as they said, conditions were not at all bad. Nothing like as slippery as they were at the beginning of the month, when most of the crews did their reconnaissance. It's a long drop now into the next time control at Gerard Mer. Don't you think it's time we pushed on? No, I like it here. Well, I'm going anyway. Got to get to Saint-Loup. And Saint-Loup is the only point through which the rally passed twice. In fact, there were cars driving through from seven in the morning until five in the evening. On we go. Then a nice steady drive towards Dole, where we stop for lunch. Tom Candish's Lotus checks in, and soon we'll be leaving on the main trunk road to Geneva for about 20 kilometers before branching off to the south again, heading for saint Cloud. This scenery made a lot of the Scottish competitors feel at home. one of the Greek entry from Athens. This is the first time that extra seals are fixed and everyone's anxious to see they're really securely on because a lost seal means 300 penalty points. Up to now, probably fewer marks have been lost than in any Monty since they began as conditions have been so unexpectedly good. Bob Crawford and Bill Sire leave saint Cloud for Chambéry, and that's where the special sections start. John Spinzel surrounded by Christabel Carlyle and spare wheels. It is at Chambéry that the vital decision on changing tyres must be taken. For the private entrant, it is the last chance, but works-backed entrants have much greater scope. This works Healy, driven by David Siegel Morris, for instance, had 48 wheels spread all along the route, so was able to change as conditions required it. Don't they have pretty waitresses in France? And they're away on the first and most lethal of the special sections over the Col de Granier and the Col de Cocheron. The later competitors had to cross these in a snow blizzard. Paddy Hopkirk's rapier takes off into the night. Four hours later, they arrive at Rive de Gear. This is the next time control after Chambéry, and several cars had bought it on this, the first of the special sections. Bill Banks hadn't waited till then to bend his motor car, but did a pretty good job of it on the run up the Adriatic. Bobby Park's Jag prepares to leave on the first of the three short sections to Bourg Argental, La Mastre, and Val de Bain before the longer run across the Rhone Valley to Bedouin and the second speed section up Mount Ventoux, the French National Hill Climb course. 
James Lang has his carnet stamped at the control which, like most others, is manned by members of the local automobile club. While Carter and Collinson get away on the long journey that will take them over Mount Ventoux and along the narrow road through the dawn to Lake Quatre-Chemins. And what a glorious dawn it was. So often the talk after the Monte is all over is about the terrible snow on such and such a section or the fog and ice we met around the middle of France. But this year, driver after driver commented on the thrill of driving through this perfect dawn. Spinetti and Brunt in their Morris. They've come a long way since we saw them leading the starters out of Monte Carlo. An Italian Lancia passes a Dutch daff. Go on, after him. I knew you were holding the map upside down. Cotter and Collinson lost a radiator hose just here and dropped two minutes worth of marks at the next time control, the only penalty collected by the ITV team on the whole route. Eric Jackson on the circular tour from Monte Carlo. Karl Kikisch, a German entry from Frankfurt. Jean Guichet. And Peter Harper from Oslo, going very well indeed and heading rapidly towards the notorious Col de Blaine. Douglas Ray and Ian Stevenson collect their card at Le Cat Chemin and motor off rapidly on the speed section against the clock. Frederick Scott and Roger Parks in the Vauxhall from Glasgow are the next men in, and away they go on into the mountains. This is the third speed section, and here's Peter Riley. George Park's Jaguar, Peter Fitzgerald's Ford, Roy Pinder's Jag, Morris Davies, and Frank Brown and Graham Arnold, still on the speed section, holding the car steady as we race between the lines of trees. And any moment now, we'll be at the control. Up we come, card stamped, thank you. And we're off again, out of the sunshine and plunging down into the shadow of the tunnel. We're really traveling now, but what's that ahead? Looks as though somebody's overdone it. A driver lying in the road. A headlamp. Skid marks. But where's the car? There it is, well and truly pranged. Unrad was the driver, and that's what's left of the Citroen. The ITV camera car takes him off to hospital, and we are back with the rally and heading for the Col de Turini. Here come Frank Brown and Graham Arnold again. And James Lang and Kenneth Riley take this Highland dancing business a little too much to heart. Whoops! Oh, that's what he was looking at. Peter Bolton on a nice even keel. And Geoffrey Mabb's motor car, which shouldn't be that way up at all. Now we're almost home. We're well in the sunshine, and it won't be long before the Mediterranean is glistening below us as we come down over the Col de Nice and head for Monaco by the Moyen Corniche and the time control of the Jardin Exotique. And that's where we'll find a good meal, a hot bath, and at last, a good night's sleep. And here's the first British finisher, Bill Banks, with a bit of unscheduled modification. But this is the moment, safely here at Monte Carlo, with two and a half thousand miles of rallying on the clock, and for the largest number of competitors in years, safely home with no penalty points at all. The cars are sealed in the official park, and that's the last we shall be allowed to see of them until the day after tomorrow and the race on the Grand Prix circuit. Let's have that drink you bet me that we wouldn't make it with a clean slate. Come on, I've got a foolproof system. No, I'd sooner just drink. So we make the most of Wednesday our day off and relax in the warm Mediterranean air, getting ready for the thrills of the Round the Houses race tomorrow. And now it's Thursday, and the 120 best place competitors, including a very large number of British drivers, are ready to race round the Monaco Grand Prix circuit and try to improve their markings.
And there goes Carlson, driving his little Saab very, very fast indeed. Into the Mirabeau bend, into the station hairpin, and around. Paddy Hopkirk in a great hurry to get from the Mirabeau to the station. And car number 170, Peter Proctor covering the same ground quite fast enough to make sure of being fourth in the overall placings. Round the Mirabeau bend comes Peter Harper. His sunbeam, along with those of Hopkirk and Proctor, took the team prize again this year. Down he goes to the station hairpin. And away under the bridge. Pat Moss doing her four laps at tremendous speed. She bumped a Renault who didn't give her enough room to overtake at the end of the second lap, but even losing a couple of seconds, she was still much too fast for Anne Hall's Anglia and made absolutely sure of the ladies' cup. Phil Walton throwing the big Jaguar around the circuit very rapidly, but he had the bad luck to wreck his gearbox and got pushed off to the dead car park very disconsolately. And here's car 52 being flagged away with Vic Elfer driving. Like so many others, this crew arrived at Monte Carlo with a completely clean slate. But they'd lost time on the first speed section through wearing the wrong tyres. But they've certainly got the right boots on it today, and away it goes round the houses. Gordon Wilkins prepares to get away in the TWW Anglia. He drove this car with Michael Frostick as part of the ITV team. And there he goes, wagging his tail behind him. That's a little less upsetting and quite a lot faster. But any moment now, he's going to be overtaken by 202 Oberhammer's BMW. He was also overtaken in the overall results by Westwood Television's John Spare. And this cost TWW's chairman, Lord Darby, the £100 side bet that he had had with Westwood Television chairman, Peter Cadbury. But I expect Gordon Wilkins is too occupied at the moment to be thinking about that. And home they all come, hoping that they've been able to improve things a little. Now we wait for the official results. All the serious motoring of the rally proper is over for another year and there's plenty to do in the evenings in Monte Carlo. But there's still some extra fun and games tomorrow if anyone's interested, and that's the maneuverability tests. They line up for the start of this timed trial, and Pat Moss becomes involved in some complicated evolutions with the Mini. I wonder if she's any good at bowling because she's missing these nine pins like nobody's business. Paddy Hopkirk caught flu on the second day of the run and Jack Scott did most of the driving after. But the sunshine has put him right and he's having fun on the manoeuvring test. While Louis Chiron looks on. Roy Merrick shows a very interested French crowd just how fast an E-type Jaguar can perform. Incidentally, the fastest time of the day around the houses was put out by Lyndon Sims' Aston Martin. It does make you gasp, doesn't it? Soon the test will be finished and then it's all over bar the shouting until next year. But there's plenty of shouting at the prize giving as Eric Carlson receives his trophies. The first Swedish driver ever to win the Monte Carlo rally. This is the high spot of a wonderful year in which he also drove his Saab to first place in the RAC rally and the Swedish rally. And so as the other competitors receive their prizes, we come to the end of the joyride because that's how the rally has become known to the drivers. The general feeling, one of the easiest for years, with no real surprises in the results of the 1962 Monte Carlo Rally.